Thanks for checking out the Open Sky Fitness Podcast with Rob Dion. Rob is a personal trainer certified by the National Academy of Sports Medicine. He's a corrective exercise specialist and a performance enhancement specialist. Rob is also a level one CrossFit instructor, but he is not a doctor. If you got any injuries or medical issues, go see a physician. And when it comes to working out, it's always best to have a trainer watch your technique to get you started. So be careful, don't sue us, and enjoy the podcast. All right, let's do this thing. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Open Sky Fitness Podcast. I'm Rob Dion, and I'm here to tell you that no matter where you are in your life, you can always be healthier. And we're here to help you get there. Okay guys, so if you have questions about your own health and fitness, or if you have questions that you want us to ask our guests for you, write us on Twitter and Instagram at Open Sky Fitness with the hashtag AskOpenSky. You can also email me, Rob at OpenSkyFitness.com, or go to OpenSkyFitness.com, and you can leave a voice memo right there on the tab on the right side. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have an awesome show for you today. I'm sitting here with my lovely wife, Devin. Hey, hey, hey. Devin is a holistic nutrition counselor and a gyrotonic instructor here in Los Angeles. And, you know, we have a great interview for you with a woman named Amy Berger. Um, and I discovered Amy through the grapevine. Uh, she, w- w- the conversation we have today was very near and dear to me because um, I have family that struggled with Alzheimer's. And she wrote a book called The Alzheimer's Anecdote. And my grandmother on my father's side has Alzheimer's or had Alzheimer's. My mom's mom, who I grew up with, um, she's got Alzheimer's. She's in a home now. Um, basically, she was like my second mom. She's always been in the house as I was a kid growing up. Um, and um, recently, my mother had to move her out of her um, her house because she was just n- no longer capable of taking care of her. Yeah, and it was. I remember as we started to see this decline happening. Yeah. Um, you know, your favorite, we have a picture of you and her on our kitchen, uh, wall with, um, the original recipe to pasta fazul. I don't know if you talked about this with Amy, but I don't think I did No. Um, you know, but one of your favorite memories of you and, and grandma is making your favorite meal pasta fazul. And to, to yeah. this day, it's your favorite meal. We have it at Christmas if we can every year or certainly yeah. around that time. Yeah. And, um, you, we were doing a videotape of her cause we wanted to videotape her before she started to decline. And, um, you said, Grandma, you know, how, you know, just real quick, just tell everybody how you make pasta vazul. And she goes, I don't, I don't remember. And yeah. then you started saying, well, don't you do this? And don't you do this? And you have the spork, uh, uh, salted pork and the, or what is it? Yeah. Well, it's, well, there's salt pork, salt there's pork. kibasa, yeah. there's, yeah. There's and you put all the, you know, and you do the beans and she goes, how do you know that? It, and the truth is she doesn't even remember teaching you this. And yeah. this was such a huge yeah. part of your connection with your grandma. And it's just so sad when, I know. when you see that. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And then we tried, we tried, we'd actually tried doing a video interview with her, um, that I was really excited about, um, just to kind of like document. And yeah, it was, it was sad because she had had all these great stories of growing up in the Bronx as a kid. Um, and I'd grown up with those stories my entire life of like, you know, what they did on hot days and how she got beat up by her older brother for asking her mother for a penny. One mm-hmm. time she was down on the street. It's actually really singing for pennies, wasn't no, she? Well, well, that was, oh, that, that was when she got older, but uh-huh. like when she was a kid, when she was young, she was probably like six or seven years old. She was down playing with all the kids and, and the kids wanted to go get ice cream. And so they were like, we're going to go down to the, to the store, you know, if, and we're going to go get some ice cream. And when you were a kid in the Bronx like this, you know, you would play on your street, right? But you wouldn't really go far from your, from the brownstone, right? They, they lived on the third floor. They had the, they were at the top floor. And so, my grandmother yells up to her mom, my great grandmother, and says, Ma! And she's like, you know, and my great grandmother only spoke Italian, so that she yells down, I can't speak Italian, so I have no idea what she would say. But she, <laughs> anyway, so she's like, Mom, Mom! And she's like, What? You know, she sticks her head out the window and she's like, I need a penny, I'm going to get some ice cream. And she just waves her off, like, Go away. And she's like, Mom, give me a penny, I want to get some ice cream. And then, like, the kids are all, everybody's waiting, all the neighbors hear her yelling for a penny, and it was a lot of money for my great grandmother. And so she takes the penny and she rolls it up in a tissue and she drops it off the side, three stories down. My grandmother picks it up. She goes, gets her ice cream, has this amazing day. And then she gets home and my brother's, her brother's there, my uncle Tony. 
and he smacks her. Oh, she opens the door. He smacks her right upside the head, knocks her to the floor and beats the shit out of her. <gasps> and just like, you know, because he embarrassed her mom in front of everybody on the street when they didn't have the money for that. Aww. And it was like, and she had to throw a penny down. And so she like, <laughs> that was one of her like lessons as a kid. And like her uncle Tony was my, well, her, her, her dad died. So maybe she was like 11 or 12 when that happened. Cause her dad died. My great grandfather died when she was 10. Mm-hmm. And so, um, she, you know, anyway, it, it was all of these stories, these amazing stories that you lose, yeah, you know, and you have to remember and I have to remember it. And I was hoping to gather some of those stories on video when we went to go see her that time and she had forgotten all of them. Yeah. And that was really sad. And so, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, you know, tell Charlie some of these stories, but I don't know how many I'll, I'll, I'll remember at that point, yeah. you know, yeah. which is kind of sad. And it would have been great for me to show those videos to Charlie because this would be one of those generations where you can start really doing that easily, yeah. showing the videos of your parents Ancestors and your great- Ancestors yeah. having that history Keeping docu- it doc- documented. documenting it, yeah. But visually too, not just through yeah. writing, you know, no, it's right, a whole exactly. different world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We can now document all of our ancestors at this point forward and, you know, with hard drives and everything, it's not that hard and you can literally have them tell every story and then, you know, you can listen as Charlie should be able to listen to. I recorded my parents for a couple of hours talking mm-hmm. and telling stories and stuff and that'll be for Charlie to hear and. And it's a sad, but the sad thing is, is like, as much as we are so glad we can document this, yeah. um, when you lose, when, when you lose the mind in the life, yeah. in, in the, in the present life, the body's still there, the body's still working like yeah. the body works, but the mind is lost and different. It's, um, yeah. I know it's, 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 it, it is the ultimate loss Yeah, because the only thing really in life that you have are your memories. There's nothing else. I mean, it's, it's your mind. Your mind Thoughts, is, I mean, yeah. your physical feelings. being, your phys- you, but your feelings are mixed up with everything, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, my grandmother and, every, and, and if you have anybody in your family that has, has Alzheimer's or has cognitive decline of some sort, you know, emotions are uh, become uncontrollable because the next thing they know, they're young and, and, and very, they, they, they don't, they haven't, they're like somewhere in like a five-year-old's range of yeah. their emotional capacity and they just start crying. They start laughing or they, uh, my my grandmother starts acting very, very weird. Like she's, she acts like a, like a baby yeah, a in a sense child, sometimes a not bit. crying, but like just acts like a child, mm-hmm. you know, like a very young child. She's overall, luckily a very happy person. Yeah, she she must've been a mind. happy kid besides yeah. getting beat up by her older <laughs> brother. I've seen the one. opposite where yeah. they're very angry, and mean. you know, and mean. Yeah. yeah. So luckily, luckily you have that grandma. Yeah. It's- so, you know, that's why I was really interested in having this conversation with Amy and I, and I, and I know that there's a lot of people out there and there's somebody in our official coffee diet uh, group as well, who's struggling now with having uh, somebody in their family who's going through Alzheimer's and the conversation around when is it right to put that person in a home? I mean, that's a really, it's a, it's a really scary thing. And, you know, you, you know, one of the things that you wanted to talk about before we jump into that conversation is, is choices of the things that we're eating. And obviously Amy, that that's her specialty, but you know, you were thinking about, um, I was thinking more uh, on a, on the lines of a broader sense of, of life, right? How, how the, everything we do affects our health. Um, and I mean, I, this comes to mind as, you know, we've gotten all these results recently in the past couple months, um, and studies about climate change and, you know, the effects that we're, our choices are making on the, the health of the world, which is ultimately going to come down to the health of the plant life, the health of the bacteria, the health of the food that we grow, the food that we uh, eat and kill to eat, um, and and ourselves, you yeah. know. And so, I'm not going to really get into it. It's too much, except that I just want to kind of like just bring it up because I think it needs to be talked about, and I think that we need to, you know really look at the choices we're making. Um, you know, we can make a difference in this climate change with, with some basic things like, um, you know, if you have the money and granted some people just don't, and that's, you know, that's a whole nother conversation that we need to work on. But, um, if you, you know, if you have the money to make the choices of buying organic foods or supporting those farmers that don't use pesticides, don't use herbicides that are, that are having, you know, you know, if you're, if you're eating meat, which we certainly do and believe it's the best for our health, um, that you're choosing 
sources of meat that come from fa- family led farms or farms that are really ha- having a good environment around their processing of the meat around the growth of the meat that their pasture raised they're outside they're happy cows um, that's going to lower your methane gases you want to buy local if you can go to your local farm farmers market support the local and pay a little bit more for it like yeah. understand that to be a farmer you know in this day and age is really hard with these huge companies like Monsoto and these you know big dairy farms and things like that that are that make it really hard to be a smaller run farm and you're because they get tons of money from the government and things that are helping them, whereas these other farmers don't. And so you want to really help support them in in what you can financially. Um, so again, buying locally, buying organic or and or farms that are trying to do the right thing, even if it takes seven years to get organic certifications. So yeah. just look into how their practices are. Yeah. Um, and staying away from the big corporations, staying away from the you know, the foods that are being carried from all over the world to get to you, that takes a lot of gas just to, to get us there. Um, you also want to be, you know, responsible for how they're packaged, right? So if you're getting a lot of things packaged in plastics and things that can't, you know, make sure A, you recycle, but also realize that those plastics, some of them will never be recycled and they just go into our waste, um, you know, and are, are destruct, you know, having destructions on our oceans. Yeah. Um, you know, being cautious of where, where you go out to eat and how their practices are, where they're buying their food, yeah. you know? So I think it's... There's a lot of farm-to-table restaurants out there that, that, that advertise farm-to-table. And you can find it. You can actually type into Yelp, farm-to-table. Yeah. And it's, it, you'll, you'll be surprised. I find them in the most random locations, yeah. you know, around the world as we, as we travel. And, you know, I just think just, you know, it's being conscious. It's being aware that this is an issue. This is a problem. And that each decision we make has an effect not only on ourselves and our own health, but on the health of the world and other people that may not be as lucky as us. So, you know, if you have a little extra money to spend instead of, you know, saving for, I don't know, whatever you're saving for, (laughs) like, you know, the, the newest car that's out there or, you know, I don't know what, what people save their money for, put a little bit extra into the quality and thought into helping the world and the environment because we need it. And even if here's an idea. So one of the things that, you know, we have, we actually have an affiliate uh, relationship with a company called butcherbox.com. And Devin and I also, uh, we get butcherbox every month. And in fact, actually there's probably a butcherbox. I'm not even kidding on our front porch. I got it. I got an email this morning said that it had been shipped. So, Hmm. um, so we should have an order. That was that crash we just heard. Maybe the (laughs) butcherbox delivery guy just Just threw it over (laughs) the fence. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so if you're interested, basically what this – what ButcherBox is is a a monthly delivery of meat and it's frozen when it arrives and you basically keep it in the fridge. Now, maybe it doesn't add up to all the meat that you consume that month. However, it's a step in the right direction. I think the starting starting monthly cost is like 125 bucks and uh, and basically what you get is – well, you can choose. You can choose uh, random boxes where they'll send you an array of meats or you can basically pick and choose whatever you want. Um, but if you want to check it out, it's called butcherbox.com forward slash open sky fitness. And if you order through that, through our, uh, affiliate link, um, basically you get, uh, uh, you get to claim f- a free, um, bag of bacon or whatever package of bacon. And you also get $10 off of your first order. That's awesome. So, uh, so that's a pretty good thing. And, and we've, I mean, it's been over a year. We've been using them for maybe two years at this point. Mm-hmm. And we really do dig it. And we like their food and there's certain things that we prefer and don't prefer. And the company's great at like, if you send them a message, you, I do not want any more pork or you, you know, you just go to your account and you can adjust that. They're really good about that. So um, that's a step in the right direction when it comes to choosing a farm that is sustainable, choosing farms. Basically, you're voting with your money on how you want your food to be, um, how, the quality of the food that you that you want to be present in your world. And we just saw, I think it's called Imperfect Foods at at the coffee convention of all places. Um, uh, And it was really interesting. I had a really good conversation with the woman who was, you know, the kind of the saleswoman for that place. And basically they buy up all the imperfect foods that won't be sold at supermarkets because they don't look the right way. To give you an example, there was um, bags of organic mangoes that um, were too tan in color to be put on the shelves. They felt that they looked too dark. Nobody was going to buy them. They would think they were bad, but they're perfectly wonderful, delicious organic mangoes packaged, dried mangoes. So it's not only just like the imperfect fruits and vegetables that you see that are fresh, but it's also some 
you know, packaged dried fruits, dried. Gotcha. Is it imperfectfoods.com? I think it's imperfectfoods.com. All right. But well, I if you Google search like, that, yeah, Google search that. We have no affiliate uh, relationship with them, no business partnership with them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, um, Devin just found them last this past weekend when we were at the LA Coffee Festival. So uh, I would highly recommend checking that out because that actually sounds like a great idea. Um, and you they probably get bu- access to some really good stuff for, yeah, for a discounted like, price. Like cookies that have been, you know, like some nice you know, like cookies that are from sugar, you know, like real sugar as opposed to, um, you know, like, a fruit sugars as opposed to regular sugars. And they just, they can't sell them because they had new packaging. So all the old ones with all the old packaging. Yeah. Oh, they had updated packaging. Yeah. Have updated packaging that they needed to get rid of those. So, you know, it's just, it's interesting. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, that's cool. So yeah, definitely check. What was the website again? I think it was, it's just look up imperfect food delivery. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. All right. Thanks. That's pretty cool. I, I'd be interested in looking into that too. Um, all right, guys, let's do this. Let's jump into this conversation. I think we've chewed your ear off enough. Uh, let's jump into the conversation with Amy Berger. All right, guys, I have Amy Berger on the line right now. Amy is a U.S. Air Force veteran and certified nutrition specialist who specializes in using low carbohydrate and ketogenic nutrition to help people reclaim their vitality through eating delicious foods and showing them that getting and staying well doesn't require starvation, deprivation, or living at the gym. Her motto is, real people need real food. She blogs at toitnutrition.com, where she writes about a wide range of health and nutrition-related topics such as insulin, metabolism, weight loss, thyroid function, and more. She has represented internationally on these issues and is the author of The Alzheimer's Antidote Using a Low-Carb, High-Fat Diet to Fight Alzheimer's Disease, Memory Loss, and Cognitive Decline. Amy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. That is a mouthful. I have to shorten that bio. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, well, you, you wrote it, but you know what? I think it does a really good job at capping of uh, of recapping what you do and what you've been doing. Um, I so I've been really loving uh, all the stuff that I've been learning about you over the last you know over the last few days because I like to dive in and see what people that I'm interviewing are up to. But one of the things that I'd really like to to, to find out starting out is kind of how you fell into this. How does someone fall into uh, not only the ketogenic diet and, you know, like a low carb diet, but also then gearing it and, and, and aiming it at Alzheimer's specifically? Right. Well, so my story is not unlike that of a lot of other people. I got into this for weight loss. You know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm a career changer. I didn't go to like, you know, undergraduate college for for nutrition um i found this leader in life i was i was overweight for most of my childhood and adult life and i i was never obese but i was chubby and i was chubby despite doing exercise you know i like you mentioned i was in the military i'm not afraid of a hard workout and no matter how hard i work no matter what i did this weight would not budge and i spent years and years blaming myself you know there it must be my fault i need to exercise even more i need to eat even less you know really beating up my self esteem and um my mother got a used copy of the Atkins book at a yard sale. So that's how you know how long ago this was. I don't even know if people even still have yard sales, but she never read it, but I did. And it just made sense. And it was so different from everything I had tried, but I had like exhausted so many other possibilities. And I said, you know, I, I might as well just try this. It's so different. I don't know, like what's what's the harm in trying? And of course it worked very well and it did not stick the first time. You know, like like a lot of people, I, I tried a low carb diet and I it I stopped and started many times before I stayed with it for the long term. But um, once I did stay with it for the long term, you know, I, I love the food that I get to eat. I love how it makes me feel. And I was in and out of jobs that I just didn't like. I wasn't fulfilled by them. I didn't have any career satisfaction. And it occurred to me like, hey, nutritionist is a career. Maybe I could do that. I could actually have this be my job and help other people learn about this. So that's what I did. I went back for um, for graduate work in nutrition. And I would say now, even though I my personal start in this was because I wanted to lose weight, all the things that I've learned about how low-carb or ketogenic or, or restricted carbohydrate diets work over the last several years 
I am now convinced that weight loss is actually the least impressive, least important thing that this way of eating can accomplish for your health. Um, but as for the Alzheimer's, I have no family history of Alzheimer's. Um, I do have a family history of type 2 diabetes, obesity, stroke, and cancer. So we're all stocked up in the family. We didn't need Alzheimer's, but I read the book Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Taubes, which your you know listeners are probably somewhat familiar with. And that book was the first place I ever heard about a possible connection between glucose, insulin, and Alzheimer's. And I read that and I said, wow, that's really interesting. You know, it, it wasn't super personal to me because I don't have the family history, but it was fascinating. And I was thinking, you know, I'm into this, like I'm into low carb. I read the research papers. I love learning about it. How have I never heard about this before? But I just filed it away in the back of my mind as something to maybe look into later on. And it was a couple of years after that that I was in graduate school. And when I had to do my thesis and I had to pick a topic, I said, you know, let me go back to that Alzheimer's thing and see if there is even enough scientific research and literature that I could write a thesis. Like I was doing a literature review of, of a topic. You know, is there even enough published stuff on this to write a thesis? And lo and behold, when I started looking, it's everywhere. I was stunned that this stuff is hiding in plain sight. It was everywhere and nobody was talking about it. And the reason that I ended up writing my book is because this, this was my thesis topic. It was Alzheimer's disease as what they call type three diabetes or diabetes of the brain. And after I graduated, I said, this, this is truly potentially life-saving information and nobody's going to know about it. It's going to sit on my professor's desk. It's going to sit on my laptop. No one's going to know about it. So I said, I have to do something with this. I have to put it out there. And um, I self-published as a little rinky-dink PDF. And then a, a publisher happened to find that. And they actually offered me a book deal, which is it's never going to be that easy for me again to get published. But I'm, I'm glad it's out there now because I think this really is life-saving, life-changing information. And very few people are, t you know, this This is well known, I think, in, in the, the scientific research community, but it's not trickling down, not only to the average neurologist and the average family doctor, but to the patients, to the people that need this information the most. They have no idea about any of this. Why do you think that is happening? Or why do you think that is not there, that it's not happening, the, tri the trickle down? I honestly don't know. You know, they say that it takes an average of, I want to say, seven years, but maybe it's 17 years. So I'm, I, I don't remember which one. One of those, it takes that long for that kind of scientific, academic type lab research to to find its way into medical guidelines or into, you know, the average doctor's office. And I just, I have a feeling that maybe... We're so convinced because Alzheimer's seems on the surface so mysterious and so scary and so frightening that I think it's hard for people, even medical professionals, to believe that this could be a diet and lifestyle disease just like type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease or PCOS or, um, you know, and really difficult for them to wrap their minds around even the possibility that there could be a diet that could help this. I, I never use the word cure. I don't even use the word prevent because we don't know for certain that we can prevent it, but that, that a certain way of eating could at least be somewhat beneficial for this. I, you know, I have, I have Alzheimer's on both sides of my family. My, my, my father's mother and my mother's mother both have mm -hmm. my, my, my father's mother passed away a long time ago, but my grandmother is currently living with Alzheimer's in a home. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, and it is debilitating, not only for the person who in which it's happening to, but also for the family, there's no more, that communication is gone for, for most of the, as, as time progresses. And it's really, it really is sad. I think it's, it's it, one of the things that that's got me curious is that so often we talk about our nutrition back in the 40s and 50s and how it only has more recently become an issue, right? In terms of the way in which we're eating, we're eating these high processed food diets and we're consuming way more processed carbohydrates than we were in the past. However, Alzheimer's seems to be affecting the people that were – that was when they were growing up. You know, so is it because their diets kind of took a left turn in the 80s or, you know, when everybody was trying to do low fat or in the 70s when everybody was trying to do low fat and they, these people all jumped on that bandwagon? 
or is it just a gen- is it mostly a genetic thing? And had they switched over to maybe a more high fat ketogenic diet, they would have been able to sidestep that potentially. I know you're not saying it's a cure in itself. Yeah, I think I think it's both. Maybe I mean there there is a genetic component to this disease, um, but it's it, it's called the ApoE4 gene, and people you can have Alzheimer's without having this gene though. This gene definitely increases risk for Alzheimer's, but you can absolutely develop Alzheimer's without this genetic history. Um, as for the diet, I think I think the reason we're seeing it happen in the older people right now is because yeah, it was right right at their childhood was kind of the inflection point when this began to change, right? Maybe the late 50s, even the 60s is when the message about saturated fat started and, and cholesterol started to kind of get into the public health sphere. That like, oh, you know, like, like President Eisenhower had a heart attack and all that. That's when this stuff started. So if you spend the next 30 to 40 years eating certain things that maybe you weren't eating before, your family wasn't eating before in previous generations, then yeah, three to four to five decades later, you're going to start seeing the consequences. And I also think this is why we are now seeing Alzheimer's in younger and younger people. This used to be a disease exclusive to elderly people. It used to be like, oh, grandma's losing her mind, you know, grandpa's senile. They, They actually called it old timers disease, right? They would joke about that. We are now talking about people in their 50s and 60s. So this is not an elderly person's disease anymore. And that could be for the same reason that that now ever younger, even from from literally before we're born now, we are awash in refined carbohydrate in in a, in a super, super highly insulinogenic environment, you know, foods that massively raise insulin, you know, even from the time that that babies are in utero, this is what they're exposed to while they're gestating. And it's so we're already born behind the metabolic curve. So I think the reason it, it struck people older is that they had a foundation of at least a childhood and maybe a young adult life of a healthier diet and lifestyle. And it only caught up to them much, much later in life, whereas it's catching us, it's catching up to people now, 50s and 60s. And I, we're probably going to see this starting in 30s and 40s if, if the trend continues. It's just going to get younger and younger because we're going to be that much more affected. Do you think that it's almost the same exact progression in the way in which delayed onset diabetes came on and now it's type 2 diabetes that's being developed in younger kids? And now, now like Alzheimer's is going to be something that's you, what you're calling now di, you know, type 3 diabetes is going to be something that's coming on now no longer after in, the, in their 70s, 80s. 90s, but starting, like you said, in the 50s and and even now coming earlier to people in their 20s and 30s? Well, yeah, I do think that. And actually, here's the thing. I mean, let's let's take a step back. This this phrase, type 3 diabetes or diabetes of the brain, where this comes from is that the primary problem in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's is that neurons, the cells in certain regions of the brain, have lost the ability to get energy from glucose. So I I like to call this a metabolic problem. And metabolic means it has to do with the way the brain gets energy. It's basically a fuel shortage or an energy crisis in the brain. And um, they can measure, they can actually measure the brain's uptake and usage of glucose by, by a PET scan. And they can see that the decline, this decrease in the brain's ability to get fuel from glucose actually starts in people's 30s and 40s. But when people are that young, they don't have any signs or symptoms of cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's because they're still young enough and healthy enough that they're compensating. And it's only when this fuel shortage goes on for so long and the problem gets so bad that the brain can't compensate anymore, that's when you start showing the signs and symptoms. Maybe then you're in your 50s and 60s, but the disease process took root in your 30s and 40s and they can they can measure this and that's that's what we have to be aware of nobody wakes up all of a sudden with alzheimer's disease this is a disease that starts years and years before same as type 2 diabetes the glucose rises a little bit year after year the insulin rises a little bit year after year it's only after that's gone on so long that 
detecting that in the blood test is like the last step. That's actually late in the game by the time the blood starts to show that the problem is happening. Well, the A1C hemoglobin is usually where we, we would be testing for uh, for diabetes, right? And I think you wrote about it in your book specifically talking about how that's just a faulty way to test for uh, being diabetic. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. This is a, a huge point that is being missed, I think, in so much of conventional medicine and nutrition right now. When we diagnose type 2 diabetes, it's always only looking at blood sugar, right? Looking at your fasting blood sugar, blood glucose, or your hemoglobin A1C, which is believed to be an average of a longer term measurement of your blood sugar. They never look at insulin. And there's so many people, like literally without exaggeration, millions of people that have perfectly normal blood sugar, but it's only normal because that blood sugar is being kept in check by sky high insulin. And it's the chronically high insulin, regardless of what your blood sugar is, it's the chronically high insulin that is a major driver of um what metabolic syndrome, hypertension, gout, PCOS, cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's. When you have chronically high insulin, you are at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, period, regardless of your genetics, regardless of your family history. So there's there's all these people that think they're metabolically healthy or even worse, they have a lot of weird, unexplained health problems. And they go to the doctor and the doctor's like, well, the blood work looks fine because nobody ever measures insulin. And the insulin would tell you that, oh boy, there's a problem here. And people will test for insulin. And, and if so, how do they do it? So you can get a fasting insulin test, which is pretty good, but the, there is a shortcoming. And that is just like with blood sugar, the fasting level sometimes is normal because let's say you ate dinner and then you knew you were having a blood test in the morning. So you didn't eat your nighttime snack. You didn't eat breakfast. So you've gone all those hours without eating. Your insulin is back down to quote unquote normal. So, but when you eat a meal, especially if it's a meal high in carbs, your insulin skyrockets. And in some people, it actually stays elevated most of the day. It never even really comes back to normal before you're going for your next meal or your next snack. Um, so if your fasting level is elevated, you kind of already know there is a problem. If the fasting level is not elevated, but you know you have signs and symptoms of high insulin, you can just kind of infer, you can assume you have high insulin. And things to look out for would be, um, it, it, this is going to sound a little weird, but all of these are, are you know, I hate the word evidence based, but you can find scientific, you know, published peer reviewed papers that support the role for chronically high insulin in, like I said, hypertension, high blood pressure, gout, erectile dysfunction, PCOS, um, obesity. Like if, if you're like me and you couldn't lose weight no matter what you do, you think you're eating a good diet, you're exercising, you can't lose weight. A lot of people with insulin resistance have migraines, um, skin tags, um, all kinds of stuff. And um, it's, there, there might, there's a very, very small chance that somebody could have a high fasting insulin and it's just a weird blip. Like if you, on the way to the lab, if you get stuck in a traffic jam and you get really stressed and aggravated, your blood sugar is going to go up. And so your insulin is going to go up. But in most people, if that fasting level is elevated, that's kind of a, a warning sign. Got it. So there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of little indicators that we could be picking up that indicate that we have high insulin levels on a regular basis. Uh, and, and so those, those were the ones that, cause I was going to ask you, what are some symptoms that would be, uh, you know, that would be obvious for some people without even having had tests for this. Yeah. It sounds like the testing itself is a little wonky because there's so many different variables that are that that potentially might you might get it might get slightly skewed. Is there is there like one specific thing that someone should try? Like cuz even if you like you're saying you let's say you did a fasted test and it's the next morning just like you would do for your A1C, but you're going in the next morning, well, if your A1C is showing that your sugar levels are certain or at a certain level, in the blood, wouldn't also then there be the presence of insulin in the blood? Or you're saying that it's like it doesn't correlate necessarily? I thought insulin and and, su and sugar in the blood uh, always were correlated. Am I not right about that? What do you mean by correlated? Like I mean, in terms insulin... of like if there's high if there's sugar present in the bloodstream, then there's uh -huh. going to be insulin in the blood because 
Well, so you're you're always going to have glucose and insulin in the blood. If you don't, check your pulse because you're probably dead. <laughs> like right, your okay. blood sugar should never be zero, nor should your insulin level. You're always right. going to have some amount. It's wh what we don't want is the chronically high levels. And so the, the issue, I guess the point I'm trying to get across is that there's a lot of people with a normal level of blood sugar, but their insulin is super, super high. So, um, and you won't know that unless you get the insulin tested. But like you said, there are a lot of weaknesses with any kind of test, even blood sugar. Like I said, if you were, if you got into a traffic jam or something on the way to the lab, your, your blood sugar is going to be elevated. Um, and so I don't think there's any one single test that people should do that's definitive. What you have to do is look at the whole picture. Look at your, like if you have high triglycerides and low HDL, that's that's kind of a, an indirect sign. Um, there's, there's indirect indicators. When you look at the total picture of your physical appearance, whether it's weight, like I said, skin tags, acne, there's all kinds of skin stuff that's related to insulin. Um, and then and then other markers like the triglycerides, the HDL, some of the liver enzymes, there's the whole picture can kind of point to to what's going on. I don't I don't ever really like looking at one number in isolation because any any one of these could be out of whack for any number of reasons. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And 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 excuse my kind of like uh my trying to figure this out because this is this is I mean it's not necessarily uh rocket science, but at the same time, you know, it's it's kind of for a lot of people a lot to digest and and to try to figure out on their own. And one of the you know one of the things that we're talking about specifically is Alzheimer's and and you've noticed specifically a change when altering the diet for people that are either just starting out with, you know, maybe some signs of Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, um, as well as as well as people that are well into Alzheimer's, like that have had it for years potentially and are starting to notice some kind of reverse. I, I think you mentioned in here specifically a, a doctor that had uh, done some studies on Alzheimer's patients and tried util utilizing the ketogenic diet or a high fat diet. And there was somewhat of a reversal. Is that true? Yeah, it's um very much limited, unfortunately, not to the people with severe like end stage disease. This is more people in the mild to moderate form. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't say it's ever cured. I think that that's a very dangerous word to use. But yeah, we see we do see market improvement and, and as measured by some of the diagnostic tests for Alzheimer's disease, like objective improvement with doctors assessing them via these diagnostic tests. And then, of course, their own subjective reports saying i my my thinking is much sharper. I'm able to do things I wasn't able to do six months ago, and it um it it definitely depends on how severe the condition is and how strong the intervention is. You know, for some people, a lot of the the published research, some of it's done with the diet. A lot more of it is done with what's called the exogenous ketones or even MCT oil. You know, I don't know how far ahead of things you want to get, but. The, the thing, the most encouraging, most heartening thing in Alzheimer's research right now is that even though these cells are not metabolizing glucose properly, so like I said, they're basically starving to death, and that's, that's what Alzheimer's is. It's this starvation problem in the brain. These cells can still take up and use ketones. So it's like this alternative fuel for them that most people just don't have because we're eating carbs all the time. You don't produce, you only produce ketones when, you're, when your insulin levels are very low and usually when your carbohydrate intake is very low. But you can produce ketones also by just taking a ketone supplement, which is available now, or using MCT oil, which is a special kind of fat that's more easily converted into ketones. So even when somebody's still eating a high carb diet, if they take the exogenous ketones or use MCT oils, they can still have elevated ketones. And a lot of the research has been done with that just because you can imagine like for people like me and you, it's hard enough for a young, healthy person who wants to just eat a low carb diet. It's hard enough sometimes for that person to stick to it, let alone someone who's impaired and who like they can be belligerent. They're uncooperative. They don't understand why they're not allowed to have their muffin anymore. And you're giving them this, this cheese omelet. So, um, but yeah, we generally, we do see improvement, not in everybody, you know, it's very, the research is kind of in its infancy. So I never over promise anything, but compared to 
the standard of care and compared to the alternatives, which is basically nothing. There is no effective treatment for this condition whatsoever. The drugs are practically useless. At best, they slow the decline. They delay the worsening. They don't stop the worsening. They don't reverse it. Um, so com compared to anything, I think this ketogenic strategy, whether it's the diet or the exogenous or both, do it all, hit it as hard as you can. This is, I think, the most promising and not only most promising, most scientifically and biochemically sound and rational approach to this. One of the things that people are going to push back against, which they always do, um, and I think it's, you know, it's slowly changing, uh, is the conversation around cholesterol. Um, you know, especially when we're talking about the older generation, this has been ingrained in them that cholesterol is the thing that they need to avoid if they want to stay alive. Yeah. Can you just dissect that just a bit for us? So maybe alleviate some of that concern. Yeah. I mean, man, you could have a two hour podcast just on that alone, but, um, I mean, we have right. had it, but you know, like, so you can give us the abridged version. We've been, we've talked quite a bit in extent about, you know, about the importance of cholesterol as well yeah. as the, not necessarily the direct correlation between heart disease and cholesterol. But, you know, like I would love for anybody that's just tuning in and maybe they're just new listeners. Uh, it's also, you know, we do these, you know, I've been doing these podcasts since 2013. So it might've been a couple of years since we've done one specifically about cholesterol. So I think it would be great for an update at this point. Yeah, no, I'm happy to happy to talk about this. I love this stuff. Um, the, we'll start. I mean, since we're focusing on the brain and Alzheimer's, I, let me start by saying you cannot have a healthy brain or healthy cognitive function without cholesterol, period. End of sentence. Um, your brain is about. I want to say 20, no, not 25, 25% of all the cholesterol in your entire body is in your brain for the physical structure of your brain. Every cell membrane, every neuronal membrane, every mitochondrial membrane, every myelin sheath, the, the myelin sheath that protects and surrounds the axons and neurons that helps neurons communicate with each other, it helps cognitive function happen properly. Um, those are built out of cholesterol. They need cholesterol. You, the, the literal physical structure of those cells and of your brain requires massive amounts of cholesterol. And, and as for correlations, um, this is sort of what they call epidemiological or it's, it's correlative. We can't prove cause and effect, but they've done studies of several, several thousands upon thousands of people. And especially in older age, the higher your cholesterol, the lower your risk for Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, the better your cognitive function, and generally speaking, the longer you live with higher cholesterol. Like the amount of cholesterol in your bloodstream tells you nothing, zero, about the amount of calcified plaque in your arteries. It doesn't. People, people that have heart attacks or that, that have cardiovascular disease run the gamut from high cholesterol to low and everything in between. Um, cardiovascular disease and heart attacks and strokes have so much more to do with other things besides the amount of, of cholesterol and cholesterol particles flowing through your bloodstream. And this, um, you know, when, when I was a kid, like, like a little kid, we're talking like very late 70s, early 80s, you know, cholesterol is already starting to be a fear mongering thing, but not quite as bad as when I was a little older. Um, eggs used to be considered brain food, probably because of the yolks, because of all that cholesterol, not just the cholesterol. Eggs are loaded with B12. They're loaded with choline, vitamin A, iodine with, well, I don't know if they have iodine, but all these other things that the brain needs like like healthy cognitive function doesn't happen in a vacuum you need all of these nutrients to help that happen and we've been scared away from some of the foods that are richest in these nutrients even fatty fish they consider fish brain food fish is also high in cholesterol especially fatty fish so this cholesterol fear mongering has just got to go it's really well, to borrow your phrase, it's just been this weird left turn into nutritional disaster, let me say. I have um, – I just recently found out uh, about a client's um, significant other had gotten a uh, blood test back from his doctor, high cholesterol, uh, immediately panicked and is now a vegetarian. Um, as hasn't eaten meat in months. Um, and uh, the cholesterol obviously has come down. 
Um, but, you know, this seems to be a very uh, common pattern for people. They get their blood test back. Their doctor, uh, you know, this, I guess, falls into the category of doctors aren't necessarily staying up to date on what's the current scientific evidence. And they're just pumping out the same stuff from 20 years ago. Um, what would you say to someone like that? Well, um, the first thing to know is that your blood level of cholesterol has very little to do with the cholesterol in your food. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's not like, like when you eat blueberries, you don't turn blue. When you eat a bunch of spinach, you don't turn green because the body doesn't work that way. You don't just absorb every single thing that's in that food. When you eat a lot of egg yolks or when you eat a lot of butter, you don't automatically absorb all that cholesterol. Your own body, your liver manufactures more cholesterol than you could ever eat unless you were living on a steady diet of literally like nothing but salmon fat and egg yolks and butter and cheese. And even then your liver would probably still make more. Um, and your body makes it because you need it. This is not some, your body is not turning this stuff out to kill you. And a vegetarian diet probably will lower cholesterol levels for even for reasons other than actual less cholesterol in your food. But does having a, having a lower blood level of cholesterol doesn't automatically guarantee you protection from, from cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. So why bother? <laughs> if, you, if you want to do a vegetarian diet, do it. But it's not, you know, like vegetarians die from heart attacks too and they die from cardiovascular disease too. So, um, and, and yeah, that, that fear mongering, unfortunately, a lot of the doctors are just not up to date. And I, you know, and statin drugs are a whole separate issue, but... Dale, Dale Bredesen is the doctor you mentioned before. He's the one that's spearheading a lot of the research on dietary and lifestyle interventions for Alzheimer's. And he tries to get his patients and research subjects off of statins because by impairing the body's own synthesis of cholesterol, statins really mess with cognitive function. This is a well-known side effect of these drugs. It's even, you can go right to the, um, the US FDA's website or the Mayo Clinic's website. They list very clearly memory loss, confusion, you know, cognitive impairment are side effects of these drugs. And when people stop taking the drug, that generally goes away. But how often do doctors tell people People to quit the statin. And to be clear, like, let's not get sued here. I'm not a doctor. I'm not providing medical advice here. I'm not telling anyone to stop their drug. But you need to be aware that this is a well-documented effect of these drugs and that, that doctors who know about this and doctors who try to treat patients for cognitive issues generally get them off the statin for that reason. What kind of, uh, you know, is there is there any kind of side effect or concern that a say like say a patient somebody like my father who's been on statins since 1995 um you know i've 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 sent them podcast episodes specifically talking about cholesterol and statins and the importance of cholesterol you know in the body and in, and for the mind and uh you know is there a side effect? Somebody new listening to this has a father, has a grandfather, even has this, you know, maybe themselves listening to this. Is there a side effect to getting off the statins? Like, I think a lot of people are concerned that I'm going to get off the statins. I'm immediately going to have some kind of adverse side effect and I'm going to drop dead from something. And so they just don't want to. Is there a weaning off process? What's the what what, what should they be looking for? Right. So again, with the caveat that I'm not an MD, so this is not medical advice, I would always advise to work with a doctor, preferably try to find a doctor who's low carb or keto friendly, and they'll, they'll be more knowledgeable than the average doctor about this issue. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no need, like, like some medications, you really do need to wean off of them slowly. You can't just quit some cold turkey. As far as I'm aware, there's none of that applies to statins. What you would probably see is a jump up in your cholesterol, which is exactly what we would expect to see. Um, but I would, I would definitely work with a physician. There's, there's a bunch of websites. Maybe we can put them in the show notes. Or the, the, there are websites now where people can search for low carb and keto friendly medical and nutrition professionals in their area. So they might be able to find one. And if you have, if you have those uh, those websites specifically, please mm -hmm. feel free to send them to me, and I'll I'll make sure to include them in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, let's. So we've mentioned now low carb keto a million times. Uh, if there is somebody that's been living under a rock and that doesn't understand what that means because it's such a hot topic now, um, can, you, can you give us some guidelines? 
Yeah, so depending on who you ask, these terms do or do not have precise definitions in terms of the amount of carbohydrate. A low carb diet is just that. It's a diet that's low in carbohydrate. It's not super, super strict. You know, some people might still eat a little bit of fruit or a little bit of, you know, beans or maybe small amounts of things like butternut squash and stuff. A ketogenic diet is just a low carb diet on crack. It's it's a very, very strict diet specifically intended for the purpose of inducing what we call ketosis, which is where when when your carbohydrate intake is so low, your body switches over to being fueled by something else other than glucose and carbohydrate. I mean, your body always runs on a little bit of glucose no matter what, but the primary fuel source, source of your body then becomes fat. And these other things called ketones are another fuel molecule that are produced as kind of a byproduct of burning fat. And so, of course, the diet's really good for weight loss and losing body fat, but it's good for so many other things because of this huge wholesale metabolic shift away from primarily being fueled on glucose and carbs to primarily being fueled on fats and ketones. And there's no, most people will say, that anything under 20 total grams of carbohydrate a day will put you into ketosis. And that's true for most people. Many people can have more carbohydrate than that and also be in ketosis. It's very, it's very individual thing. People's carbohydrate tolerance really varies. Some people can have a surprising amount of carbs and still be in the actual state of ketosis. Some people have to be a little more careful. But even then, to get Many, many of the beneficial metabolic effects we see with some variation of carbohydrate restriction comes from lower blood glucose and lower insulin levels. And not everyone requires super strict keto to do that. Most people can do that just cutting back on carbs. Um, some people, especially with certain medical conditions, really do need to be in ketosis, but like not everybody does. You talk, I mean, your book is very, is obviously geared towards Alzheimer's. So it's not necessarily a weight loss book just to be just, it's interesting because I'm so used to reading books that are specifically about weight loss that when I'm reading your book, I'm just like, it's so, wow, she's really making it easy on these people in terms of like the restrictions. Uh, and it's like, oh wait, it's not a, it's not a weight loss book. And one of the, so, but would you say that the ketogenic diet is not necessarily just a low carb diet, but more of a higher fat diet? Yes and no. And that, that's a good question because everybody's always saying it's a high fat diet, high fat diet. And it is, but the reason the diet works, what induces that major metabolic shift that we're looking for is the reduction of carbohydrate. It's the lack of carbs, because here's the deal. You could eat 20 bagels. And as long as you ate enough butter and cream cheese that your diet was quote unquote high in fat, like the percentage of your calories from fat was high, you would think that this is keto because the effects come from the fat. That's not the case. The metabolic effects come from the lack of carbs. But the thing is, when you're eating so little carbohydrate, you got to eat something. And, and yeah. so you're going to eat fat and protein. And most people just calorie wise, fat is the predominant macronutrient. It's the predominant fuel. Um, so yeah, the diet is high in fat, but I definitely emphasize the low carb part. Even I use the word ketogenic because that's what people know now. That's what no, nobody's searching anymore for low carb diet. You know, like if, if I put right. that on my YouTube, nobody would find me, but I, I actually prefer the phrase low carb or low carbohydrate diet because that puts the emphasis on the carbohydrate restriction rather than being in ketosis or because like when you use this way of eating for different purposes, it's a different ball game, right? Somebody with epilepsy or someone with Alzheimer's or someone with a traumatic brain injury or some other migraines, they might need therapeutic ketosis. They might need super, super low carbs and very high fat. Some, and on the other hand, I get so many clients coming to me who are struggling with weight loss because they're drowning everything in butter and they're putting all this oil in their coffee. They don't, um, they don't need that sort of therapeutic level of fat. And it's, um, so for them, they don't need to emphasize the high fat part. They need to emphasize the low carb part. Would you recommend, <clears throat> uh, cause you're talking specifically about people who are trying to lose weight. We're talking about people with cognitive decline, but would you recommend this for an emotional, uh, from an emotional angle more so like, a, like therapeutic in the sense of like people that are going to therapy, people that might be struggling from anxiety, people that might be struggling from depression. I, I know from personal experience for myself as well as others as that I've 
um, that I've been, you know, that I, that I know that are, that are doing, whether it be keto or even intermittent fasting, which I want to dive into very soon, that there is a significant change in anxiety and depression. And, um, and even when we're talking about, cause when you're talking about losing that brain fog and having, and having more cognitive function and being able to focus, there's this level of feeling like, you know, I've got, I, I, I feel like I've got this, like the, the world doesn't feel like it's coming at me. I feel like I can attack things. So have you utilized this in that form? Yeah, this is this is huge for mental health. The ketogenic diet or just carbohydrate restriction is huge for mental health. And there's actually a growing number of psychiatrists using this type of approach with their patients, sometimes in, in conjunction with medication, sometimes the diet all by itself is good enough. But yeah, there's so many mechanisms. Like we're so used to thinking of this diet as a weight loss diet. And it does so many other things. Like if someone out there listening is at a weight they're happy with and they're thinking, well, I don't need to lose weight. I'm not going to do keto. Get that out of your mind because keto can do so many other things for you. I I like to think of it as a weight normalizing diet. If you have weight, you can gain weight on keto if you need to. You just have to do it right. Or you can kind of maintain your weight or you can lose weight. So it, it's, it doesn't have to be a weight loss diet. But yeah, I think so much of what we consider anxiety or panic attacks or just rage irritability is hypoglycemia. Because we've all felt this. I know I've felt this. I've been behind the wheel ready to like literally kill somebody on the road. And I just, if I could have a bite of a donut, I'd probably be fine in two seconds. So a lot of that is unstable blood sugar, you know, very big highs and lows, swings in blood sugar. Some of it, some of it, you know, keto, I don't think we have time to get too deeply into the mechanisms, but it could also be that when people go on a ketogenic diet, they're eating much more nutritious food and they're getting a lot more B12, they're getting more omega-3, they're getting more iron and zinc, maybe even more complete protein. All of these things, again, just like cognitive function, mental and emotional health doesn't happen in a vacuum. We need various vitamins and minerals and, and, and amino acids to make serotonin and dopamine and all these happy chemicals and neurotransmitters. Um, and then there's you know, the, the ketogenic diet does induce a number of other biochemical changes that sort of state stabilize, for lack of a better word, the brain. It, it increases levels of a neurotransmitter called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, that's known as um, a calming neurotransmitter, whereas something like glutamate, like, ah, excitatory, it kind of helps balance all that out. So there, there are so many mechanisms by which this works, and I definitely think um, it's very much worth trying. And of course, like I said, some, some people do great just with the diet. Some people find that the diet helps, but they still need medication. But whatever helps, helps. Is there a way – you have a chapter in, in the book about intermittent fasting. You don't go into too much detail about it, but you, you, but you do have it in there as – and correct me if I'm wrong – as a way to kind of jumpstart into a type of ketosis um, without having to necessarily – be eating a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet. Am I right about that? Yes and no. So okay. no, 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 <laughs> go please. Fasting, intermittent fasting, and I, I'll use that phrase because again, just like with the word keto, that's what everyone uses. Yeah. I so much prefer time restricted feeding or time restricted eating because when we say intermittent fasting. Most people are eating one or two meals a day. And if you're eating two meals a day, are you really fasting? Is that really a fat? But you know what I mean? That's, it's just semantics. Yeah. Um, I was an English major in undergrad, so I get all <laughs> nerded out on that stuff. But um, any, I, the main goal, um, unless you have a very specific, severe medical situation that you're using fasting as a therapy for, most of the goal of intermittent fasting or just having a, an eating window is to spend some amount of time in a quote unquote fasted state during which your blood sugar is going to come back down to a low normal, your insulin is going to come down to a low normal. So even if you're not doing a low carb diet, that's still a beneficial thing to do. And they've done this. They've done tons of studies of intermittent fasting and in people on normal, regular, high carb type diets, and they still see at least some degree of improvement in blood sugar regulation, in weight and all this stuff. And um, I think it's even better when combined with a diet where you're already in a low insulin and low glucose state most of the time, um, all that does is just enhance it. And I think it used to be a long, long time ago when, when the keto diet was used specifically for children with epilepsy. It still is, but when it used to only be used for that, they would start everybody off with a fast. They would fast these poor kids for like three, three or four days 
as a way to get them into ketosis faster. And I, yeah. you, you can do that, but it's not necessary. Um, the way to get into ketosis is to keep your carbs really, really low. And I actually think, and, and most, most people would agree, I think that intermittent fasting is easier to do once you are on some kind of a low ish to ketogenic diet, because it's easier to go for an extended time without food when your blood sugar and insulin aren't on a giant roller coaster all day. You know, when, when your mood and your blood sugar and your energy levels especially are already kind of evened out, it's easier to go without food, whether we're talking six, eight hours, you know, six hours, eight hours or 24 hours. But that's, you know, that's when, when you don't eat and, and when your insulin levels come down, especially you are eating on the inside. Internally, your cells are eating. They're actually eating your stored body fat. That's why you can go 24 or 48 hours without eating. You know, that's why we don't starve to death immediately. That's what body fat is for. It's backup fuel. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think intermittent fasting can be very, very helpful. The reason I don't emphasize it so much in the book is because a lot of people that maybe are dealing with Alzheimer's might be frail and underweight, especially if they're they're elderly. I don't recommend fasting for people that are already kind of malnourished. And, and just so we're clear, that includes young people, especially young women, who are already maybe not eating enough, you know, young women are terrified to put food in their mouths, let's face it. And, and they're over-exercising, they're burned out, they're fatigued, they're depressed, they're anxious because they're simply not eating enough to fuel what they're demanding of their body. And so I think intermittent fasting, ju just like keto itself, is so helpful and so beneficial in the right circumstance. But then everybody thinks they have to do it. Everybody thinks they're doing something wrong if they're not doing it. And then people who should not be doing it think they have to do it and they get into trouble. So it, right. yeah, the, the, fasting, the fasting is just one more strategy, one more tool that you can do, but not everybody has to. Um. I have a question specifically about paleo, but I wanted to just kind of button up the intermittent fasting. Do you have – if somebody – let's say somebody was going to do this, right, where let's exclude young women and even young kids and you know, and, and, and people who are – who do have Alzheimer's who might be frail and don't have any body fat hardly on them at all to, mm -hmm. let, you know, to be fasting and, and utilizing their own body fat stores. Um, is there specific protocols that you, would, that you would recommend? There's a lot of very common ones. Um, but how often should people or could people be, uh, potentially be intermittent fasting? I think it depends on their situation. You know, I don't really like to give blanket recommendations. The more metabolically derailed you are, for lack of a better, you know, the more severe your, your metabolic derangement, the more you can probably stand to fast. You know, the more the more you might benefit from spending extra time in a state with very you know low normal blood sugar, low normal insulin. But um, I think there's ways to ease into it too. Like like I think just skip a meal. Like what you have have breakfast and lunch and skip dinner, or have lunch and dinner and skip breakfast. Like whatever it is, you don't you don't have to come out of the gate not eating for three days. You know, like you can just 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 think about or even if. Because there, you, you and I know that there are some people out there, maybe some people listening even now, who can't even imagine going without a snack between meals. Like they can't even imagine going two or three hours without eating. So for that person, start by skipping the snack or start by have three meals a day, but instead of having them five hours apart, have them six or seven hours apart. Like give yourself a little more time between meals yeah. um, and then ease into it. Um, you can rip the Band-Aid off if you want all at once, but I just um, – I don't have any real blanket recommendation. I don't. I think um, certainly not everybody needs the extended fast, like these multi-day fast. People can really get into trouble if they don't know what they're doing, but no one's going to keel over if they skip a meal or two. Okay. You know, but, but people people should be aware. I mean, if if someone out there is taking medication for type 2 diabetes, especially insulin, or if you're on blood pressure medication, you have to work with someone that knows what they're doing because – 
you're going to get better very soon and your need for that medication is going to change and we don't want you to be over medicated and actually have like bad potential dangerous side effects from that. Yeah, you mentioned that in your book in terms of people who are on blood pressure medications. This is also will help lower their blood pressure significantly. uh, And then with the blood pressure medications, they would be in a dangerously low level of blood pressure. Uh, So that would be something that's one of the reasons why you should be talking to your doctor specifically if you're going to be doing something like this and you're not sure. Um, especially if you're on medications. There's a, there's, right. a, there's a part in your book where you talked about um, living a, a paleo lifestyle um, might help maintain lifelong insulin sensitive sensitivity. Um, but if you are if you if Alzheimer's disease uh, has taken hold and it's the beginning stages, the ketogenic diet will be a better choice to uh, reserve the progression. So are you saying that like if maybe if you have some insulin sensitivity, a change of lifestyle into being paleo is, is maybe something that you could do that would just help lower, keep your, keep your insulin sensitivity fairly low. You don't necessarily have to dive into the ketogenic diet, uh, unless of course, you know, Alzheimer's or some kind of cognitive decline has taken hold. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good point to address because I get asked often, you know, do do, do I need a ketogenic diet to prevent or potentially prevent Alzheimer's? Or like, I'm 60 years old, I'm 70 years old, I've been eating garbage my whole life, like, is it too late? And and no, I think desperate times call for desperate measures. If you are already in the disease process, then you need something dramatic. To, you don't. That's not the time to play around. Like, don't dip your toes in the water. Do that big cannonball into the deep end, yeah. um, and and do keto. But if you are healthy and you just want to stay healthy, so I I don't think keto is required to potentially prevent Alzheimer's. I always say what is required is eating and living in such a way that keeps your blood sugar and insulin at a healthy range. And the amount of carbohydrate that any one of us can eat and still accomplish that is going to be different. Some people are going to have to stay at 20 or 50 or 70 grams of carbs a day. Some people can have 200 grams of carbs a day and be fine. I mean, that's that's not most people, not, not in today's metabolic environment anyway. But paleo is a great way to go to maintain health that's already there because paleo is not low carb by definition, right? You can have tons of fruit, you can have starchy vegetable, you know, sweet potatoes and beets and squash well, and all that. They, they say but, in terms of starchy vegetables, it's to be eaten in moderation and the yeah, same I mean, thing with fruits, but it's not, yes, you're, you're correct. It's not necessarily a low carbohydrate diet. No, but it's, I was going to say it's lower. It tends to be lower than the normal diet. Even if you are eating some fruit and starchy, you're eating a lot more meat and non-starchy vegetables. That's correct. Um, so I think that's a – I mean I don't I don't know if you listen to Mark Sisson or if you are aware of like Mark's Daily Apple. And, yeah, Mark's, and been on our, Mark, Mark's been on our show yeah. twice, yeah. Love him and I love Rob Wolf. And they – you know, they're both – they both have a heavy keto focus now, but – they know and they've built their careers on paleo primal because that gets most people really, really great results. Yeah. So I don't think, um, no, not everybody needs keto, but um, for p- people that do need it, paleo or or just kind of Mediterranean diet is not going to get them where they need to go. Right. The, for the people who really do need to jump into the deep end of the pool. Uh, yeah. And, and the thing in, is yeah. too – no, I, I can't say so much for Alzheimer's, but things like metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes or even obesity, you can do keto or very low carb for a while and then gradually kind of liberalize your carb intake, especially if you have really changed your lifestyle. If you're a lot more active, if you've put on a lot more muscle mass, your carbohydrate tolerance can improve. Yeah. You might be able to like reintroduce certain foods at, a, at some point, like you don't necessarily have to do keto for the rest of your life. Some people do, but a lot, that's, you know, it's something that I see, and maybe you see this too in the nutrition world now where people get wedded to one thing and they think they have to do that forever. When let's say you start out, you have morbid obesity, you have type two diabetes, you have XYZ issues, and you do keto or low carb for two or three years, you are literally not the same person you were when you started. So it's very possible that a, a slight change in the diet might be even better for you. I, I have plenty of people that I know have reintroduced potatoes and beans and, and some starches, and they're doing great. 
Yeah, I think that's something to keep in mind, especially around diets. People should not marry themselves to anything specific. They should be doing what works best for them. And that means really paying attention to what's happening with them. If they were, if they're, if they're doing keto for a couple of years, as you mentioned, and they transition into doing paleo, I actually recorded a keto versus paleo um, a video years ago. It's, I, I think it's got like 50,000, 50,000 downloads on, uh, on mm-hmm. YouTube, because I think that that's the, I think that's the message I think people need to hear is that the, like ketogenic can be fantastic and it can be a lifestyle for a lot of people. People might really enjoy that lifestyle. I don't know if that necessarily is going to be the lifestyle for everybody, but I think the paleo lifestyle is a little more manageable um, in terms of going out with friends, having dinner out, you know, being a little more social. Um, but I think that, uh, again, the big, the big thing is, is really being able to do what works best for you and paying attention to what feels good for you. Yeah, uh, and, and, and understanding that what works best at one point might not be what works best six months later or six years later. Yeah, as your body changes. Yeah, exactly. Well, Amy, look, I, I mean, this has been this has been awesome. We're ta- we're about we're about talking for an hour, and and I really appreciate all your time. We didn't even get it. I had some notes here specifically talking about uh, hyperinsulinemia, and I also wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the mitochondria and type two diabetes. Um, but you know what? Maybe we'll save that for another conversation conversation because I think that, um, and even talking about chronic inflammation and such, because I think that these are really important topics that people need to understand. Um, so maybe we can have you back on in the future. This was, this was really fun. I really appreciate it. Before we wrap this up though, can you please let people know where they can find you? What's the best places to learn from you and, and maybe even potentially work with you in the future? Sure. Yeah. My website is two at nutrition.com. That's T U I T nutrition.com. And there's a tab there that says work with me. So people can find out about consultations. And my book is the Alzheimer's antidote. They can find that on Amazon. And, uh, I have a YouTube channel now it's, um, same name to nutrition. And let's see what else I'm also on Patreon, but you know, maybe you want to check out my blog first before going there. And, um, I think that's it. I'm on Twitter. I'm very, for some reason, I don't like Facebook. There's a lot of social media platforms I don't like. I love Twitter, and my handle there is Tuit Nutrition. Awesome. And we're going to put all of those in the show notes. I have all the links for that as well. I highly recommend, guys, checking out the Alzheimer's Antidote, especially if you – I mean it just gives you a really good handle on why eating a low-carb diet and a high, you know, high, low, low-carb, high-fat diet actually has some amazing benefits, especially if – because it turns out, according to I think something you had written in your book, fifty percent of people over eighty five suffer from some tor- some type of Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, and it's really it really is something that's affecting not just you, you know you personally, but also the, your kids down the line, your families. It, it has a ripple effect. So the more you can learn about it, the more you can potentially hopefully sidestep this. So uh, Amy, thanks again for coming on. Uh, this was this was really fun and enlightening. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, and one more time, Amy, thank you so much for coming on. She's She was just great. She It was so fun to talk to her. She was very easy. Remember, so... You know, going to flash forward, guys. There's a there's an episode of the podcast coming out where Devin and I were talking about um, her feeling slightly insecure about showing up on YouTube without makeup, and you know, we're making videos without makeup or being prepped in, a, in that way. And I had mentioned that there was someone um, to you that there's someone that we interviewed on the show, and it was Amy. Um, Amy has here's the great thing about Amy. She she she's like obviously from listening to the show, she's just a wealth of information. Uh, but you know, she does get dressed stop obviously for some of her videos but then there's other videos of her where she literally is just like guys I wanted to make a video for you she's like in she's like basically in her pajamas mm-hmm. she just woke up or she's like I only have 10 minutes I'm gonna make this video for you uh, there's there's no prep there's no lighting there's no it's just the roll camera let's do this I'm gonna give you the content and the information that you were looking for and I think that there's something really uh, great about that because it just it, it shows that if you are willing, if you, if you, if it's for you, if it's about sharing information and teaching, then what you look like shouldn't matter. That's true. You know, and so, and, and and I'm not saying that there's you know anything wrong with the way that Amy looks. She looks great. She's just you know, and I just love the fact that she was just willing to just be out there because it's such a thing in our society to have to look good as a, as a female. Oh yeah. On video. Oh yeah, and I, I fall, you know, I fall into that, and I think you know part of that comes from you know my history of of being in the dance world, being in the acting world. It's like a got to be ready to perform. Yeah, I mean, I've been told to get nose jobs, boobs jobs. I've been told, I've been, uh, somebody grabbed my tricep one time and said, if I worked at a gym, I wouldn't have this. You know, I think that 
Um, and those are excuses, right? <laughs> They're just excuses. But um, it's true. I do need to... I, I think there's something beautiful about just being who you are at what, whatever time of day. Yeah. And again, like you, as you say, if it's really about getting information out there and really connecting to people, it doesn't really matter what the, what the heck you look like. Yeah, I think that it's all the best. I think the people that are sharing, that are doing a really good job of it, are sharing because they have this un, unquenchable desire to teach and, and give. Mm-hmm. And if your desire is to teach and give... What well, you're wearing shouldn't necessarily, or the makeup you have on your face exactly. shouldn't necessarily be a shouldn't is the is the word, right? Well, it's like a, it's like the the thing is 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 fear, fear of being, you know. For me, I think it's a lot. It still comes up of like fear of being um, looking, being humiliated, being ashamed, you know, um, not looking perfect, right? You know, all those kind of psychological work that I've been doing, I still con- you know, continue to have work to do. Yeah. Yeah. We're never finished. No. So wait, are you saying that the me using the word, you shouldn't be like, that shouldn't ha- hamper you or hinder you from, uh, from performing? Is that in any way a judgmental way of vo- like vocalizing it? Like, is that my judgment then on you for using the word shouldn't? Like I, if I say to you, that shouldn't stop you. I think that it's, I, I mean, I kind of agree with you, right? Okay. That it shouldn't stop me. But, but the question is, also... what is stopping me? You know, right. it's like not really helpful in the sense of like, yeah, that shouldn't stop you. But then, okay, that shouldn't. But what, right. but I guess what there's, is? There's something there's a, there. There's a deeper There's a deeper discovery there for you that you need to really yeah, dive into to and find out to... why. Why is it that you think that this is so important that you like being like looking a certain way is so important that it's going to stop you? And it's funny because my logical mind doesn't think that. My logical mind is very much like, of course, it doesn't matter. Yeah, like, you who know? cares? And of course, and I, and I also feel like I'm a very attractive woman, luckily. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like wearing makeup or not wearing makeup. I mean, 90% of the time, I don't wear makeup. Up and I'm not embarrassed to go out. Right. You know, so what is it? For some reason, once the camera's rolling, you have to look a certain way. On a way. camera, I feel like being in front of more people than just the people that know me. Yeah. Like, they're, I don't know. There's, yeah. there's, I think I have to meditate on that. Yeah. All right. Something yeah. to think about. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. That's our show. Hope you enjoyed. Um, Devin and I. So, by the way, um, happy Thanksgiving because this is coming out the two days before Thanksgiving. So, we hope that you guys have a fantastic holiday. Um, you know, we've done actually holiday podcast episodes like how to basically approach and how to tackle the holidays uh, I'm going to link to those in the show notes um, because we've done a couple of them so I'll put them in the show notes for you guys maybe we should release one as well oh yeah we can re-release one so this yeah. way it pops up as, as yeah, a recent episode yeah remember how we used to do the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah like a throwback Thursday throwback Thursday but, so, but we'll do it in the interim we'll do it we'll do like yeah. a th- a th- can you do like a I'll do it well I'm not going to do it for Thanksgiving what I'm going to tell you guys for Thanksgiving is uh, is you know in, enjoy your holiday, and you know if you're going to a party, show up. Don't show up starving, right? Uh, if you're going to be at a buffet, or if you're sitting down to a big Thanksgiving dinner, uh, and you're planning on having more than one helping, start with your first helping being all green vegetables as much as possible. Fill that up, fill yourself up with green vegetables. Then go back in for all those delicious second things that you would normally stuff yourself with. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things. Just be mindful of how you feel and yeah, understand. Consciousness would be my number one thing. And, yeah, and understand that if you are. Ex- Exhausted after your meal. It's probably not because of tryptophan. It's probably more so because you just stuffed the turkey <laughs> and you being the turkey. So that's but not don't a big, feel guilty about don't it. Don't feel guilty. Enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, look, there are only you know there are only really two major holidays where we you know where we have like Thanksgiving and, and either Christmas or you know I don't yeah well I guess that's not true. There's there's yeah, there's a few on others. The family. Depends on the family. That's true. So, but you know what? Don't don't. Guilt is not an option here. It should just be, you know, it's information. Take care of, it's information. Take care of yourself. If you did for some reason not take care of yourself, then that's an internal conversation on why did I not? Exactly. And I think I think that's the biggest thing I was saying. Like to me, going into the holidays, it's about consciousness. It's yeah. about being conscious in the moment, yeah. not just turning off and saying, "Oh, it's the holiday. I can do whatever I want, despite what any go- any goals that I want." It's yeah. it's about connecting connecting to yourself and making the choices in the moment that you are going to be happy with, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. No, and I- then if you don't reflect on, on that and why you didn't make those choices. I agree. 
And we'll we'll put together some throwback Thursday old school um, holiday tips and tricks on how not to uh, how not to fall behind. Yeah, those were good. Those were good and those were fun. So uh, anyway, enjoy your holiday, guys. Happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll gobble, see gobble. you guys. We'll see you guys uh, in the next show. Uh, yeah, guys, thanks for listening to the show. Uh, tune in next week. We have another awesome Open Sky Fitness podcast for you. All right, thanks for listening to the Open Sky Fitness podcast. Please check us out on Instagram at Open Sky Fitness, where you can follow Rob, link to the podcast, learn about upcoming guests, and post questions for him. You can also ask us questions about your own health and fitness, and we'll try to answer them on the show. For our blog, show notes, and more information about training with Rob Dion, go to OpenSkyFitness.com. Our music is by H. Scott Salinas. You can check him out at HScottSalinas.com. So for Rob Dion and the rest of the Open Sky Fitness team, this is Jeff Meacham saying that no matter where you are in your life, you can always be healthier. And we're here to help you get there. All right, I'm done.